Theodore Carlson, historian, food writer, and host of the Feast podcast. And every episode, we're taking you on a culinary adventure exploring the great stories behind the meals of the past. From Thomas Jefferson's 1,200-pound cheddar cheese to King Midas's killer recipe for beer. Each episode of The Feast uncovers the hidden stories of how history was made at the dinner table. We'll show you how empires have been built on nothing but sugar, how people have lost more than their cool thanks to a fallen souffle, and why neighborhoods have endured thanks to a shared love of smoked salmon. Find out what hidden histories are lurking in your kitchen pantry on Season 2 of The Feast, available on Apple Podcasts, or wherever quality podcasts can be found. Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 56, Classical Sculptures. The archaic Greek era, in both historical terms and in art and architecture, ends conventionally around 480 BC, primarily because that year marks the critical moment in Greek history when both the Persian and Carthaginian invasions of Greece and Sicily, respectively, were halted. It is followed by a 31-year period of transition, from around 480 to 450 BC, known as the Early Classical Period, that is most easily recognized in the archaeological record by a distinctive sculptural style that has been termed the Severe Style. The Classical Period saw a revolution of Greek sculpture, which is sometimes associated by historians with the popular culture surrounding the introduction of democracy and the end of the aristocratic culture associated with the Kuroi. The classical period also saw changes in the style and function of sculpture, along with the dramatic increase in the technical skill of Greek sculptors in depicting realistic human anatomical forms. Poses also became more naturalistic, notably during the beginning of the period, as Greek painters and sculptors shared the tragedian's fascination with both the human and the divine. Throughout the decades of change and growth that marked the 5th century BC, both drama and the arts reveal a powerful drive to organize the world in accordance with harmony, balance, and proportion. During the 4th century BC, Plato, in the blueprint for the ideal society that he describes in his dialogue, The Republic, would identify justice as the condition that was obtained when all the parts of the soul and state are in balance. The connections that Plato posited between beauty and truth underline much of the Greek view of the world throughout the classical period, and perhaps in no other medium can this worldview be demonstrated better than statuary. Greek sculptors achieved the loftiness that they did within the constraints posed by a variety of conventions. The two generations or so that followed the Persian Wars marked a period of transition during which time Greek sculptors began to emancipate themselves from the canons of the Archaic period, as the severe style comes to distinguish classical styles from those that had gone before. Some of the changes may have had to do with a rejection of Eastern influences in the wake of the bitter conflict with both Persia and Carthage, as the ties with the Near East that were so conspicuous in Archaic styles now seemed more tenuous. Furthermore, the appearance of the severe style at this moment may well have its origins in the burst of Greek confidence following the victories over the Persians and the Carthaginians, which brought with it a new civic consciousness and sense of identity amongst the Greek citizens. As tragedy became more dramatic with the addition of a second actor, so too did the visual arts grow less static during these decades, as action became increasingly more important. 
Conveying a strong sense of movement in a still medium is no small achievement though, and some of the most outstanding artists of these decades managed, despite the constraints of their craft, to build a sense of anticipation and excitement. Ancient Greek monumental sculpture was composed almost entirely of marble or bronze, with cast bronze becoming the favorite medium for major works by the early 5th century BC. Smaller works, though, such as figurines, were in a great variety of materials, with the most popular being terracotta. The territories of the Greek world, except for Sicily and southern Italy, contained abundant supplies of fine marble, with Pentelic and Parian marble being the most highly prized, along with that from Macedonia and various sources in Anatolia. The ores for bronze were also relatively easy to obtain. Marble statues were mostly found around temples and other major Greek buildings. Both marble and bronze are fortunately easy to form and very durable. No doubt there was also sculpture made in wood, about which we know very little, except for acrolithic sculptures, which sat atop temples. They were usually quite large, with the head and exposed flesh parts in marble, but the clothed parts in wood. Since bronze had a significant scrap value, very few original bronzes have survived, though in recent years marine archaeology has added a few spectacular finds, which have significantly extended our modern understanding of the medium. In fact, many copies of the Roman period are marble versions of works that were originally in bronze. There will be more on that shortly. Limestone was used quite often in the archaic period. But thereafter, except in areas of Italy and Sicily that had no local marble of their own, it was only used for architectural sculpture and decoration. Plaster or stucco was also sometimes used for hair only. Chryselephantine sculptures, used for temple cult images and luxury works, used gold, ivory, gems, and other materials, but were much less common, and only fragments have survived. Naturally, like bronze, these two would have been valuable commodities to be stripped in later times. Many statues were also given jewelry, as can be seen from the holes for attaching it, and held weapons or other objects made of different materials too. Sculptures also were painted, but we will talk more about that next episode when we discuss wall and vase paintings. The development of Greek sculpture throughout the Archaic period can be followed readily enough from original statues of Kuroi and Korai, but during the 5th century BC, our sources of information become complicated by the wealth of information provided by ancient sources, on the one hand, and by the later Roman enthusiasm for removing, copying, and adapting famous Greek originals, on the other. Pausanias traveled around the sanctuaries and cities of Greece in the 2nd century AD, describing the monuments and statues that he saw. He used written sources and information offered by guides whose accuracy may be doubted somewhat because he often makes mistakes, and so what he says must be treated with caution. Pliny's Natural History contains a long section on bronze statues and a shorter one on those in marble. He mentions the principal sculptors and describes individual statues. These descriptions are sometimes useful in trying to identify from copies or variants what Greek originals would have looked like. They were also useful in telling us which Greek originals were seen in Rome when he was writing in the 1st century AD, because two decades prior to his writing, the Romans plundered the Greek cities of southern Italy and Sicily and mainland Greece of their art during the wars that we will one day cover way down the road. Anyways, they removed Greek statues in mass and energetically copied them in marble. Wealthy Romans, especially, thought it highly fashionable to decorate their houses and estates with Greek statues. It's fortunate, though, that they had that predilection, and so many Roman marble copies have survived, because unfortunately, most of the bronze originals have been lost. As we mentioned earlier, bronze was a very valuable commodity, and so bronze statues were not cheap. It is estimated that a bronze statue would have cost 3,000 drachmas, which is why very few have survived as old statues were recycled often and reinvented for new ones, or melted down for money when faced with harsh economic times and war, especially in the latter part of the Roman Empire, to be remade into weapons, which makes the few that we do have even more special. And so we are fortunate that we do have these Roman copies. The concerns, though, are how true to the original Greek bronze statue is the Roman marble copy, and how accurate are the written sources of Pausanias and Pliny in their descriptions. 
During the early classical period, artists and sculptors experimented with new techniques and artistic approaches, but freestanding sculpture provides the clearest demonstration of the innovation and variety in the representation of the human body that would go on to characterize Greek art in the 5th century BC. The early classical period also saw an increase in the use of freestanding statues as decorations for buildings. Such sculptures could either be public, in the sense of having been paid for with state funds, or private, but they did not serve as pieces of private art in the modern sense. Those Greeks who ordered statues privately from sculptors had not yet developed the habit of using them to decorate the interior of their homes. Instead, they set them up on public display for a variety of purposes. Privately commissioned statues of gods could be placed in a sanctuary as proof of the buyer's devotion. In the tradition of offering exquisitely crafted objects to divinities for commemorations of important personal experiences, such as economic success or victories in athletic contests, the Greeks also donated sculptures of physically beautiful human beings to the sanctuaries of the gods as gifts of honor. Wealthy families could commission statues of their deceased members, especially if they had died young, to be placed above their graves as memorials of their virtue. In every case, private statues were meant to be seen by other people. In this sense, then, private sculpture in the Golden Age served a public function in order to broadcast a message to an audience. And so, during the 5th century BC, Greek statues began to increasingly depict real people, though the style in which they were represented had not yet developed into a realistic form of portraiture. Archaic Greek statues, if you recall, are characterized by a stiff posture, imitating the style of standing figures, and were heavily influenced by Egypt. But while Egyptian sculptures continued to produce this style unchanged for centuries, Greek artists began to implement changes by the time of the Persian Wars, with the result that in the 5th century BC, new poses became ever more prevalent in freestanding sculpture continuing an earlier evolution away from stiffness and towards movement that is visible in the sculpture attached to temples. Human males generally were still being portrayed nude as athletes or warriors, while women were still being shown clothed in fine robes. But their postures and their idealized physiques were evolving towards more naturalistic renderings. While archaic male statues had been shown striding forwards with their left leg and their arms held rigidly at their waists, classical male statues now might be shown with their arms bent or their bodies weighed on the other leg. Their musculature was more anatomically correct than before, and not almost impressionalistic, as had been the style in the 6th century BC. Female statues, too, now had more relaxed poses and clothing, which hung in such a way as to hint at the shape of the body underneath instead of disguising it. The faces of classical sculptures, too, reflected an impressive calm rather than the iconic smiles that had characterized archaic figures. The early classical style, also known as the severe style, was found not only in Attica but throughout the Hellenic world and in a variety of media including bronze sculpture in the round, stelae, and architectural relief. For the first time, in the late archaic and early classical periods, we now know the names of individual sculptors. A famous early classical sculptor was Critias, but unfortunately most of his works are known only through Roman copies, with one exception, the so-called Critias Boy, which is now housed in the Acropolis Museum. The sculpture was excavated from the debris on the Acropolis of Athens and is missing a leg in both of its arms. At the end of the Persian Wars, the Persians destroyed many Greek sanctuaries. The Greeks were so angered that they took an oath after the Battle of Plataea that they would not rebuild the sanctuaries and instead they would leave them in ruins as a reminder of Persian barbarism. In Athens, all of the buildings on the Acropolis were burned and the sculptures were destroyed and cast down. The Athenians didn't re-erect any temples or restore any of their sculptures either. Instead, they covered all the statues up, which allowed them to be found by archaeologists, centuries later. We discussed in episode 17 many of the archaic statues that were found in the debris. Since the Critias boy was also found in the debris, we know it was sculpted before 480 BC, and thus it represents an important turning point from the archaic Koros to early classical sculptures. Unlike the stiff and static Koros, it has a very organic body that appears capable of movement. Like the Koros, its right leg is forward, 
but unlike the Koros, it shows a perceptible weight shift off of the central axis to make a more natural pose, as the right leg is relaxed and free, as if in mid-stride, and all of its weight is placed on the rear left leg. Thus, the right hip is lowered and the shoulders and head are loosened. The statue is the first known to use this technique, called contrapposto, an Italian word meaning counterpose. Furthermore, the mouth is more relaxed than that of the stiff archaic koros. The face is characterized by a big chin, flat cheeks, thick eyelids, and a composed expression. The head has hair, which radiates in thin strands from the crown, and is rolled up over a headband. Rolled hair like this is a particular trait of the severe style, as hair is no longer tied in folds and wound around the head. The Critias boy is so named due to its small size, just under 4 feet tall, or around 1 meter, and its attribution to Critias. This is owed to the similarity of its head to one of his other statues, in a group of two that was set up in the Athenian Agora in 477 BC, those being the infamous statues of Harmodius and Aristogiton, the Tyrannicides, who assassinated Hipparchus that we described in episode 26. Critias' sculpture pairing was intended to replace an earlier version, which originally had been sculpted by Antinor, who was possibly Critias' teacher. It was sculpted after the establishment of Athenian democracy and erected in the Agora. The use of sculpture to honor real people, such as the Tyrannicides, and its exploitation as political propaganda, was an entirely new concept in ancient Greek statuary. Antinor's sculpture set, though, was stolen by the Persians when they occupied Athens, and it was removed by Xerxes back to Susa. The original would later find its way back to Athens during the Hellenistic period, and Pausanias reports that during his time, both pairs stood side by side in the Agora. The original version never attracted copyists, though, and so it is now lost. The second version, which was originally sculpted in bronze, is also lost, but we have a Roman copy of it made in marble, which is now housed at the Archaeological Museum of Naples. The statues are larger than life-size, at 6.5 feet tall, or almost 2 meters. Thanks to an inscription on the base, we know that Critias was assisted by another sculptor, named Nesiotis. The precise role of each artist in the partnership remains unclear, but their collaboration must have been successful because their signatures are also found on various bases for other sculptures that would have stood in the Acropolis. Anyways, the statues show idealized portraits of the two heroes. A clean-shaven Harmodius, whose face appears like that of the Critias boy, is shown thrusting a sword downwards in his upraised right hand, while a bearded Aristogiton is brandishing a sword in his left hand with a calamus, or a cape, draped over his left shoulder. The two are lunging forward, and their striding poses make it seem as if they could strike at any moment. While the Critias boy introduced the transitional type of standing male nude figure, for the standing draped female figure type, the two and a half feet tall, or three quarters of a meter, statue known as Angelitas Athena, due to a dedicatory inscription from someone named Angelitos to Athena, marks the change from archaic to transitional. It too was found in the Persian debris and is now housed in the Acropolis Museum. The statue is heavily damaged though and has lost its head. It was sculpted in marble by an unknown artist and represents a female who is shown wearing the archaic pepalos underneath her aegis, a shawl-like garment decorated with a gorgon's head and fringed with snakes. This identifies the statue as Athena as she was often portrayed wearing it. Her upraised right arm survives up to the wrist and once held a spear, while the left arm is entirely missing, though traces of her left hand can be found on her waist. Although marble still remained popular in the 5th century BC, bronze was the preferred material of the sculptors who devised these daring new styles, and Athens was particularly known for its metalwork. The development of the art of bronze casting was highly important in the history of Greek sculpture, since it allowed sculptors to show a much wider range of subjects. As a result, statues could be cast in several pieces, and later joined. Creating these bronze statues, which were cast in molds made from clay models, required a particularly well-equipped workshop with furnaces, tools, and foundry workers skilled in metallurgy. A red figure Kilix, known as the Foundry Cup, 
dating to around 490 to 480 BC, and now housed the Altus Museum in Berlin, shows a scene of how these bronze statues were made. In the front, a worker tends to the furnace. In the center is the supervisor. On the right, a third worker is busily assembling a bronze figure. Behind all of them, hand tools and cast body parts and sketches are on the wall by the forge. The workers are shown nude, not because they actually worked in the nude, but because it emphasizes sweat and the intense heat. Because sculptors and artists labored with their hands, the wealthy elite regarded them as workers of low social statuses, and only the most famous ones were able to achieve such wealth that allowed them to move up in high society. In fact, Plutarch in his Life of Pericles wrote, quote, We admire the work of art, but despise the maker of it, end quote. And this seems to have been a common view in the ancient world, with a few notable exceptions, as we shall see. Furthermore, balancing weights could be placed in the hollow sections of the bronze for poses that the use of heavy and breakable marble would not allow. Properly prepared bronze had the strength to cause tension, thus allowing outstretched poses of arms and legs, which could not be done in marble without supports. Hence the intrusive tree trunks and other such supporting members introduced in the marble copies made in Roman times of Greek statues in bronze. The strength and malleability of bronze allowed innovative sculptors of the early classical period to push the development of the freestanding statue of the human form to its physical limits. The tranquility of archaic sculpture still persisted in some of the works of this period though. An extremely valuable bronze sculpture that has survived is the Charioteer of Delphi, dating to around 470 to 460 BC. An inscription on its limestone base shows that it was dedicated by Hero's brother, Polyzalus, after his victory in the chariot races at the Pythian Games in either 478 or 474 BC. Standing almost six feet tall, or just under two meters, it was originally part of a larger group of statuary, including a chariot, at least four horses, and possibly two grooms. When an earthquake struck Delphi in 373 BC, it was buried in the debris of the Sanctuary of Apollo, which allowed it to survive for archaeologists to discover. Found alongside fragments of a chariot and horses in 1896, they are now found somewhat put back together in the Archaeological Museum of Delphi. It has been associated with the sculptor Pythagoras, not to be confused with the philosopher, because this one lived and worked in Sicily. The Sicilian cities were very wealthy, and their rulers could afford the most magnificent offerings to the gods. Unusual for this era, the charioteer is clothed from head to foot, although it probably has more to do with the nature of the statue than anything else. Although most athletes at this time would have competed in the nude, and thus their statues were depicted as such, Charioteers were clothed, for safety purposes, as we discussed in episode 21. The young charioteer would certainly have been of a lower status than his master Polyzalus, and he may have even been a household slave. The charioteer is more naturalistic than the Kuroi of the archaic period, but the pose is still very rigid when compared with later works of the classical period. A few notable departures from the archaic style is that the head is inclined slightly to one side, and the statue's introverted expression contrasts with the old archaic smile. The naturalistic rendering of his feet was greatly admired in ancient times as well. It was made with hollow casting, as were most ancient Greek bronze statues. The separate pieces were cast individually and then joined together. In particular, the charioteer was cast in eight pieces, two for the body two for the head, and four for the limbs. The missing left arm shows how the arms would have been socketed into place in the sleeve. When making a bronze cast, each piece began with a clay core. Then they applied a layer of wax to sculpt it in fine detail. Then it was encased with fine-grained clay with metal pegs that secured the inner core to the outer layer. Next, the entire bundle was heated to dry the clay and melt the wax, which oozed out from the bottom. Molten bronze was then poured into the void left by the wax and then cooled. The outside was then chipped away and tools were used to smooth over and finish the sculpture. The eyes were inlaid with onyx glass and stone. Copper was added to the lips and silver was used for the teeth. All in order to make the bronze charioteer seem lifelike with a calm and controlled expression, focused on the task at hand. 
In fact, the charioteer is one of the few surviving Greek bronzes to preserve the inlid glass eyes intact. The eerie stillness of the body and the garment that falls from it, in perfect folds, shows precisely the discipline and self-control that Pindar celebrated in the aristocrats who carried off prizes in these athletic events. Yet the slight movement of its upper body and head, the tension of its outstretched arm and neck, and the open mouth all breathe life into the figure. Because of all of this, the charioteer of Delphi is one of the best known statues surviving from ancient Greece and is considered one of the finest examples of ancient bronze sculpture. Another famous surviving bronze is the Artemisian Zeus or Poseidon, dating to around 460 to 450 BC and housed in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens. It's slightly over life size, at close to 7 feet, or just over 2 meters, and represents either Zeus or Poseidon. Identification depends on the missing weapon that would have been held in the right hand. Was it a thunderbolt, the weapon of Zeus, or a trident, the weapon of Poseidon? Various images on ancient Greek pottery show Poseidon wielding the trident when in combat in more of a forward thrusting stabbing motion, while Zeus is depicted with his arm raised, holding the thunderbolt overhead in the same position as the Artemisian bronze, and so most scholars tend to identify it with Zeus, though opinion remains divided. Regardless, the god is frozen at the moment, right before his attacking movement, with his back leg on his front toes and his rear arm stretched back and frontal arm pointing forward. The statue thus has the potential for violence, and the viewer is left to contemplate the coming demonstration of his strength. Its sculptor is unknown, and the statue is not attested to in the sources. And although scholars have tried to associate it with a particular sculptor, there is no way of knowing for certain who created it. The statue is so named because it was retrieved from the sea off of Cape Artemisium in northern Euboea in 1926. It made its way there because of a shipwreck in the mid-2nd century BC. Unfortunately, not much is known about the wreck, because exploration was abandoned when a diver died in 1928 and has never been resumed. Many such shipwrecks around this time, though, were Roman vessels looting Greek art back to Italy, after mainland Greece was officially absorbed into the dominion of Rome. Similarly, the Riachi warriors, dating to around 460 to 450 BC, are two Greek bronzes that were excavated out of the sea near Riachi in southern Italy in 1972. They were found by two Italian chemists while they were snorkeling, and are now housed at the National Museum of Magna Graecia in Reggio Calabria, Italy. Since no trace of a wrecked ship was ever found, they may have been pitched overboard to lessen the weight and thus save a merchant ship during a storm. Again, the sculptor for these statues is unknown, although scholars have tried to assign it to a particular individual based on stylistic tendencies. Pliny or Pausanias make no mention of them either, and because of their appearance as warriors, it is likely that they were part of a sculpture group that celebrated a victory of some sort, and thus it has been suggested that they were probably dedications in the sanctuaries of either Delphi or Olympia. They're both standing about 6.5 feet tall, or 2 meters. One is wearing a helmet, while the other's is presumably missing. One has both of the glass inlays still in his eyes, like the charioteer of Delphi while the others is missing. They both originally would have held a spear in their right hand and carried a shield in their left, but those two are no longer there either. One is looking aside and his facial characteristics are more defined. He is shown with a beard, and this becomes fairly common after this point. His pose is graceful and alert, which would have been further emphasized with the now missing shield and spear. He shows a greater potential for movement, using a more pronounced contraposto giving the impression that he could shift his weight at any time. Their bodies are an interesting blend of idealized anatomy and naturalistic detailing of both the muscular and fleshy curviness. Emphasized are the details of individual strands of hair, tendons, cartilage, muscles, bones, and veins on the back of the hands. Sculptors were now interested in the way the parts of the body were connected and how movement in one promoted movement in the others. The body came to be seen as constructed and motivated from the inside, rather than simply viewed from the exterior, which suggested symbolic motion. The impetus of this change in viewpoint was twofold. First, Greek physicians were investigating the relationship of bones and muscles to one another, how the contraction of one set of muscles produced relaxation in another, and how muscular activity resulted in the movement of bones and tendons. 
Athletes and warriors were sources of information, and surgery was helping to establish the principal systems of movement in the body. Second, Greek philosophers too had long been preoccupied with movement. For example, Parmenides had attempted to break down motion into individual arrested moments, and Pythagoras saw the world as moving patterns. And so abstract and practical spirits alike were now concerned with movement. In addition, sculptors sometimes also worked in clay or terracotta. Few examples of this survive, at least partially due to the fragility of such statues. The best known exception to this is the statue of Zeus carrying Ganymede from the sanctuary at Olympia, dating to around 470 BC. It originally stood as an acroterion on the roof of a temple. Zeus strides along, clasping Ganymede in his right arm and holding his traveling stick in the other hand. Ganymede clutches a rooster, a love gift from Zeus for the boy who held his affection. He was a Trojan who Zeus took a liking to, so he whisked him away to Mount Olympus, where he granted him eternal youth and immortality, so that he could become the new cupbearer to the gods, supplanting Hebe. On this statue, we can see that the hairstyles are still archaic, but their facial expressions are in the severe style, so it's a hybrid of the two. The sculptural group would have been embellished with much black, brown, red, and yellow paint, traces of which are visible. It is currently housed at the Olympia Archaeological Museum. Sculptors also continued to produce reliefs for votive purposes. However, due to sumptuary laws that were enacted in Athens, the tall single-figured stelae that distinguished the archaic period were replaced in the early classical phase by smaller but broader reliefs. The challenge now for artists was to depict more realistic figures foreshortened in a shallow field. The sculptors, though, rose to task and gradually began to detach the figures more and more from the background. A good example of this is a marble votive relief from Cape Sunion that shows a young athlete crowning himself. Only about one and a half inches in depth, his head and torso are in profile, facing left, with his left arm and shoulder pulled back in the front. The relief is almost two feet tall, about 60 centimeters, and now resides in the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. Arguably, the most famous relief of the early classical period is the so-called Morning Athena, which dates to around 470 BC. It comes from the Acropolis of Athens, and so it is now displayed at the Acropolis Museum. The relief is a half meter tall, made of Perion marble, and shows several hallmarks of the severe style. The goddess displays a weighted leg and a free leg. She wears a Corinthian-style helmet and a peplos, fastened at her shoulders and clenched at her waist, and her face has a solemn expression. She rests her right hand on her hip, and with her left hand, she leans on a spear, gazing at what was probably a list of Athenians who died in battle. The undercutting of the long folds of her peplos contributes to the effect of depth, while her attitude with her head inclined downward and her hand to her brow produces a sorrowful impression. Another famous funerary relief from around 470 to 460 BC is the Pharsala Stele, also known as the Exaltation of the Flower. It was found by French archaeologists in the mid-19th century, and so it now resides in the Louvre Museum in Paris. When it was found in Pharsalus, in central Greece, it was embedded in the walls of a church. It was originally carved from Perion marble in the severe style, and the upper fragment survives intact, about 22 inches tall, or 56 centimeters. The stella shows two women, each wearing the peplos garment and a kekryphalos, or a type of hairnet, and they appear to be holding a type of flower, perhaps either poppies or pomegranate flowers. Some scholars believe that the items held are a type of psychedelic mushroom that was used in the Eleusinian mysteries. Regardless, under both of these interpretations, it has been suggested that these two women represent Persephone and Demeter, two goddesses who together symbolize the bloom of nature. The conventional opinion nowadays, though, seems to be that these figures are mere mortals holding flowers. Needless to say, the interpretation of this work has remained elusive since its discovery. Sculptors and their patrons in the Western Mediterranean had to import marble from Greece, yet Pliny tells of renowned sculptors of this period working in Greek Italy, and the few examples from there that we do still have show that the costs of shipping marble from the quarries in the Aegean did not deter ambitious commissions from the wealthy, from Teros, 
modern Taranto, in southern Italy, comes the five feet tall seated marble statue known as the Enthroned Goddess, or the Taranto Goddess, which dates to around 480 to 470 BC, and which now resides in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, Germany. The motif of the seated female figure was especially popular in the East, as we saw with Sibylle in episode 55. Here, the goddess retains the frontal view of the archaic period and wears archaic garments, those being the chiton and a transverse mantle. Her forearms and hands are now missing, but they could have been employed in a variety of gestures. The hairstyle is also archaic, but yet the face is unmistakably severe, with her bulging eyes, thick lips, and cheeks. This combination of archaic and severe traits has been taken by some scholars to show provincialism believing that the sculptors in Magna Graecia were behind the times by comparison with other contemporary artists in mainland Greece, and that they mixed these two styles either in ignorance or simple carelessness. Others argue that the use of archaic traits may reveal a retrospective interest by Western artists in evoking the past in order to beautify and dignify the present. Regardless, the use of a new transparent drapery style as seen in a charioteer from Machia, first occurs in Magna Graecia, and not on mainland Greece. And so at least in this aspect, they were ahead of developments back home, and not behind. The charioteer dates to between 480 to 450 BC, and was found in a Carthaginian sanctuary at Machia, an islet just off of the northwestern coast of Sicily. His weight is shifted at the hip, and although his arms are missing, by the way his shoulders are turned, we can see that his right arm was raised. His left hand was on his hip, where you can still see parts of the hand remaining. Like the enthroned goddess, we see a mixture of styles, as his hairstyle is also archaic, but his face is distinctly severe. It is the treatment of the drapery, though, that makes him an interesting puzzle. It clings to the body very transparently, revealing an outline of muscles around his thighs, hips, and buttocks. This would not appear in mainland Greece until the end of the century, and as we will see in a future episode, it also appears on the Metopes at Selenus. So it seems possible then that this statue was the creation of a workshop of the Greek sculptors active in Selenus. Many take the garment that he is wearing to be a racing chiton, and thus identify him as a charioteer, giving us a marble comparison to the bronze at Delphi. However, most statues in the West weren't made of marble. Instead, sculptors turned to clay as a cheap and plentiful medium. Clay thus was used in the figures that decorated the superstructure of temples, as we saw in the Archaic period, and to make cult statues, of which only a few fragments have survived. Clay was also used for the production of thousands of figurines, made from molds, and therefore were mass-produced. These figurines were gifted as votive offerings in sanctuaries to a god or goddess, and represented either the worshippers or the gods themselves. They were often diminutive versions of larger statues, and so they give us a good idea of what the large terracotta, marble, or bronze statues may have looked like. A large series of such figurines have survived from Locri. In addition, a series of terracotta relief plaques also survive that date to around 460 BC. They are hand-sized, just being under a foot tall, and are housed in either the Regio Calabria National Museum or the Taranto Archaeological Museum. Many of these reliefs show scenes of divine activity, most especially of that of Persephone and Aphrodite. In fact, two of the more famous ones are Hades and Persephone enthroned, and Aphrodite and Hermes in a chariot, drawn by Eros and Psyche. Others show ritual scenes that are often associated with marriage, so that divine couplings seem to mirror the rites of passage for mortals. These type of reliefs would have been offered to Persephone and Aphrodite by young women as their marriage days approached or during an impending pregnancy, and so they were seeking divine protection at moments of supreme importance in their lives. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is powered by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Fantasy football fans, the wait is nearly over. Football season is back, which means FanDuel is back. FanDuel is one-week fantasy football, meaning that there are new contests starting every week, and you get to choose a new team each time. There are no lengthy drafts, and there are no busted seasons due to injuries. There's no season-long commitment either. FanDuel has lots of contests to choose from, starting at just $1. Just pick a contest, choose your team, and watch your score real-time. 
new users get a free entry into the NFL Sunday Million with over $1 million in cash prizes. Just visit FanDuel.com and sign up with the promo code ANCIENTGREASE. I'll also be doing a listener league, so you'll have the opportunity to play against me and other of the History of Ancient Greece podcast listeners for bragging rights. To join, go to www.fanduel.com forward slash ancient Greece. Once again, you can sign up today by going to fanduel.com, click the join now button, and use the promo code ancient Greece. And then go to www.fanduel.com forward slash ancient Greece to join Ancient Greece's FanDuel League. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. Turning our attention back to mainland Greece, let us now discuss some of the famous sculptors of the early classical period. Arguably the most famous was Myron, who flourished between 480 and 440 BC. He was a pupil of the great sculptor Hagalatus of Argos. Hagalatus also taught the likes of Phidias and Polycletus, both of whom were younger contemporaries to Myron and who will also be discussed shortly. Myron worked exclusively in bronze, and the early imperial Roman writers consistently rated him among the greatest of all Greek sculptors. Ancient writers saw Myron as a sculptor whose work represented the epitome of the transition between the early and high classical periods, following a path towards realism, while also avoiding emotional expressiveness. Although he made some statues of gods and heroes, his fame rested upon his representations of athletes, in which he caused a sort of artistic revolution, by introducing a greater boldness of pose and a more perfect rhythm, by subordinating the parts to the whole. One of his most famous creations was the Discobolos, or the Discus Thrower, dating to around 460 to 450 BC. Originally created in bronze, several Roman marble copies of this exist. For example, one can be seen in the British Museum, but the one considered the most exquisite is found in the National Museum of Rome. This freestanding sculpture, at about 5 feet tall, or 1.5 meters, probably convenes the most dramatic sense of movement to come out of all early classical Greek sculpture, as it captures a frozen moment of time right as the athlete is about to release the discus. He is crouching at the top of his backswing as his right arm holds the discus high and he twists at the waist, a pose that is far from the relaxed and serene symmetry of early archaic statuary. The figure not only assumes an asymmetrical pose, but also seems to burst with the tension of the athlete's effort. In the archaic period, somewhat generalized grave markers were being commissioned and erected as a dedication in a sanctuary. But now, these images were becoming more specifically designed almost naturalistic representations, commemorating the prowess of a particular athlete or representing a specific divinity. Whereas archaic statues impressed a viewer with their appearance of stability, as not even a hard shove looked likely to budge them, statues of the classical period, by contrast, showed greater range, a variety of poses and impressions. The message these statues conveyed to their ancient audience was one of energy, motion, and asymmetry and delicate balance. The spirited movement of some of these statues suggests the energy of the times, but also the possibility of change and instability that underlies even a golden age. The more realistic representations of anatomy and mood evident in the severe style are also emphasized by the first appearance of portraiture. Whether this may be genuinely deemed the arrival of what we would call true portraiture is debatable though. A Roman marble copy of a portrait of Themistocles, originally dating to around 450 BC, provides a compelling example of the genre. It now resides in the Osti Archaeological Museum. It's 10.5 inches tall, or 26 centimeters, and the individualized traits in the features are evident, as are his severe style characteristics. However, the idealizing trend in classical sculpture remained too strong, and the next generation of sculptors rejected any further movement towards outright realism. Furthermore, the Romans were notorious for their love of realistic portraitures, so although this is a copy of a Greek original, we can't be sure if it's an exact copy or if it was altered to Roman taste. The High Classical Period takes place in the second half of the 5th century BC. It is known above all for the new buildings put up on the Acropolis of Athens, with their sophisticated architecture and rich sculptural decoration. Athens, of course, is not the whole of Greece, but it dominated the high classical period because it was the center of creative expression, not just in architecture and sculpture, but philosophy, theater, and historical writing. 
It had suffered more damage than most at the hands of the Persians, and at this point it had the money necessary to pay for the work of restoration and renewal. The most dominant sculptors were Polycletus and Phidias. The sculpture of the High Classical period combined idealism with accurate depictions of humans. One of the most dramatic changes was the treatment of drapery as something that revealed, rather than concealed, the body beneath. Phidias flourished from around 470 to 430 BC. Today, most critics and historians consider him as one of the greatest of all ancient Greek sculptors, but he also demonstrated an aptitude for painting. It has been said that Phidias is to classical art what Pericles is to Athenian democracy, because his personality stamped his era with his genius. A workshop of sculptors was active in Argos at this time, and Pliny says that an Argive named Hagalatus was the teacher of Myron and Phidias, and he probably also taught Polycletus, the other great Greek sculptor of this period, who we will cover shortly. Regardless, it was here that Phidias learned his unmatched technique. He created sculptures in wood, marble, gold, ivory, and bronze. Among his earliest works were a gold and ivory statue of the goddess Athena for the city of Pallene, of which no copy exists, and a bust of the poet Anacreon, of which a Roman copy exists in the Copenhagen Museum in Denmark. At Athens, he created statues of Apollo Parnopius, or persecutor of the locusts, and Athena Promachos, or protector. He also sculpted the bronze busts of famous heroes of Attica that were dedicated at Delphi and the Athena Lemnia, a bronze statue of the goddess dedicated by the Athenian clerics of Lemnos that stood in the Acropolis of Athens. Naturally, the most stunning examples of high classical period sculpture are from the Acropolis of Athens. But that will have to wait for another episode, as we will deal with the Acropolis separately. It's that magnificent that it gets its own episode. Anyways, Phidias was the sculptor entrusted with supervising the sculptural decoration of the Parthenon, as well as the one responsible for the colossal statue of Zeus at Olympia, which also will be discussed in a future episode. Polycletus was either from Argos or Sicyon. The sources differ. Regardless, he was probably also trained at Argos as a pupil of Hagalatus. He was active around 460 to 420 BC, and like most of his contemporaries, he also worked exclusively in bronze. Although none of his original cast survive, literary sources such as Cicero, Pliny, and Pausanias identify Roman marble copies of his many works. Polycletus is considered one of the foremost representatives of high classical art, as he was a restless spirit who delved into matters of artistic theory. In this endeavor, Polycletus continued the Greek sculptor's quest for idealized male beauty. He was inspired perhaps by the belief that human minds could grasp the nature of divinity, and nudity seems to have been a key element in the sculptor's attempts at the representation of perfection, as the nude male became the model for every male Greek aspiration, for military and athletic excellence, civic responsibility, sexual desirability, and even for immortality. Polycletus evidently strove for perfected images that could represent either gods or men. In doing so, this led him to write a treatise called the Canon, literally meaning a measure or rule, which investigated the ideal mathematical proportions of the standing nude male figure. The original text is now lost, but references to it in other ancient sources, including that of the 2nd century AD medical writer Galen, imply that its main principles were expressed by the Greek words symmetria, or symmetry, isonomia, or equilibrium, and rhythmos, or rhythm. Polycletus was quoted by the 1st century AD philosopher Philo as saying, quote, perfection comes about little by little through many numbers, end quote. By this, Polycletus meant that a statue should be composed of clearly definable parts, all related to one another through a system of ideal mathematical proportions and balance. Although we don't know the exact details of Polycletus's formula for perfect anatomical symmetry in his canon, the end result is said to have been manifested in a certain statue called the Doryphoros, or spear bearer. It was also known as canon, since it was his representation of his canon. Dating to around 440 BC, the Doryphoros, or canon, is representative of the transitional period from early to high classical sculpture, and is arguably one of the most important of all classical sculptures. As we see through it, the introduction of his canon of proportions in a new, more naturalistic way of representing potential for movement in the resting human body. 
The most famous Doryphoros was found at Pompeii and now resides in the National Archaeological Museum of Naples and is one of more than 50 like it that have been identified so far, which attests to its popularity amongst the Roman elite. This particular version is the best among the bunch. This statue depicts a young man carrying a spear and it stands almost 7 feet tall or just above 2 meters. He is posed in order to give a different impression from every angle of viewing. His right leg is slightly extended, while his left knee and left arm are bending to balance each other out. This is for proportion and to impart a powerful sensation of motion. He originally held a spear in his left hand, but it is missing now. The literary sources do not reveal the identity of this figure, but many scholars are inclined to view it as a representation of Achilles. Regardless, he represents the epitome of humanism, in terms of an ideal man being an athlete and a warrior. Another famous work by Polycletus was the Diadomenus, or the youth tying a headband. The original bronze dates to around 430 BC, but it is again only preserved by a Roman copy. This one is housed in the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. It stands about 6.5 feet tall, or almost 2 meters. Both of his hands are missing, but his arms are flexed and held aloft. His hands would have been tying the diadem, or a ribbon, around his head, representing the fact that he was a victor in an athletic contest. The posture of his legs and torso, the proportions, the swing of the hips, and the shape of the head are similar to that of the Doryphoros. The calculated pose of these two statues became a standard formula for idealized representations of young male athletes and warriors used in Greco-Roman and later Western European art. A famous later example of this is the Roman statue known as Augustus of Prima Porta. Polycletus and Phidias were among the first generation of Greek sculptors to attract schools of followers. Polycletus' school lasted for at least three generations, but it seems to have been most active in the late 4th and early 3rd centuries BC. Pliny and Pausanias noted the names of about 20 sculptors in Polycletus' school, defined by their adherence to his principles of balance and definition, with Scopus and Lysippus being among his best-known successors. His son, known as Polycletus the Younger, worked in the 4th century BC, and although he too was a sculptor of athletes, his greatest fame was as an architect, as he would be the designer of the great theater of Epidaurus. We will discuss all of this and more in a future episode on late classical art and architecture. Anyways, Polycletus' influence on a broad circle of students was evident. The large number of extant copies of his work dating to the Roman era also testifies to the breadth of his influence. Although Phidias' school didn't last nearly as long as that of Polycletus, his workshop at Olympia included such esteemed pupils as Agoracritus, Alcamenes, and Paeonius. Although all three made freestanding statuary of their own, the latter two were more well known for their work, alongside Phidias, on the Temple of Zeus at Olympia and the Parthenon on the Acropolis of Athens. And so we will discuss them in those contexts in future episodes. As we mentioned, the trend in the later 5th century BC was naturalized idealization and away from realism. One anomaly to that was Cressilus. He was from Cadonia on Crete, but he was trained in Argos and then worked in Athens from around 450 to 420 BC. As a follower of the idealistic portraiture of Myron, he is best known for a statue of Pericles wearing a Corinthian helmet. Originally dating to around 440 to 430 BC, it was a bronze statue of Pericles being portrayed in his role as Strategos. Pliny said that it was a work worthy of the title, and that it made a famous man even more famous. It was also described by Pausanias, and its base has been found on the Acropolis. Although this bronze did not survive, it influenced a series of Roman portraiture busts later. One of the more better preserved is the Herm of Pericles, found in the Vatican Museum. Cressilus also has been identified as the originator of the type of Athena statues in which she would wear a Corinthian helmet, mirroring the bust of the helmet of Heracles. Many ancient copies of this have been found, but the most famous of which is the 10 feet high, or 3 meters, example called the Athena of Velletri, since it was found in the ruins of a Roman villa near the modern town of Velletri. It was sold to the French though, and so now it resides in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Plaster casts of the sculpture, probably taken from the original, have been found in excavations of a Roman copyist's workshop at Baie, near the Bay of Naples, and these casts show that Cressilus's bronze was of the same dimensions as the Louvre copy. 
Pliny also mentioned a contest that took place for a statue of a bronze Amazon warrior that was to be dedicated at the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. At the inauguration of the Artemision, between 440 and 430 BC, five sculptors took part in this contest, and although each voted for himself as victor, all but one voted for Polycletus as runner-up, and thus he was named victor over the likes of Phidias and Cresselus. Several Roman statues of an Amazon warrior have been identified by some scholars as being copies of the works of Polycletus, Phidias, or Cresselus that might have been sculpted for that occasion. One in particular was discovered in Rome, near the Baths of Diocletian, and now resides in the Capitoline Museum. It shows the Amazon warrior with a solemn expression on her face after being wounded. Her right arm is raised and bent at the elbow to hang above the head, like she is shielding herself from another blow. She is clothed in a peplos that has fallen from her left shoulder, which thus leaves her bare-breasted. Private grave stelae also provided an important venue for relief sculpture in the late 5th century BC. Sumptuary laws seem to have restricted the production of funerary monuments in Athens in the middle part of the century, and so Athenians adopted a simpler style of tomb markers, and thus there was a sharp decline in the amount of difference in wealth for individuals or families in terms of grave goods. But the production of these types of private and grand grave reliefs would resume in Attica around 430 BC, and may have been stimulated both by the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, and by the decoration of the public state graves prepared for the casualties of the war. Around this time, sculptors once again began to create grave monuments with considerable skill and quality. Paraboloi, or family grave enclosures, would progressively become more ostentatious in order to emphasize sentiments of democracy and family ideals or values. A parabolus tomb had a high wall facing a road, which essentially retained the earth fill, piled behind it. The front wall was far higher than the three rubble walls surrounding the rectangular burial area that contained the graves and provided space for family gatherings at funerals or other celebrations for the dead. Since people on the street could only view the front wall, families often created a facade of carefully elaborate masonry work that would face the street in a row above, sitting just behind the front wall. Since the Athenians measured the level of public responsibility a citizen felt for the polis by his private actions, a citizen would have felt motivated to create stelae in his family's paraboloi in order to convey persistent care for family members by displaying them together in a row, connecting numerous generations. Although most stelae commemorated the deaths of men, women, young boys, and girls were depicted on their tombstones as well. These stelae were usually decorated with two or more figures, and sometimes included seated figures. The goal, though, was meant to be an idealized representation of the dead person when they were still alive, and so they were often pictured with attributes that tell us something about the deceased, such as a soldier with his arrow, an old man with a stick, or a girl with her doll. Additional figures shown represent their companions, seen saying farewell, shaking hands, and so forth. It seems that most gravestones were generic, though, as they were only individualized by an added epigram or an inscription that could tell the identity of the deceased. In general, stelae can be seen as a retrospective funerary art that typically articulates a society's ideals of social living through their depiction of a domestic sphere. Compared to other non-civic art of the oikos, such as non-funerary red-figure painted pottery, stelae were obviously more fixed or permanent monuments displayed outdoors for public viewing, and are constructed by a family for a specific person, making them far more expensive and exclusive than pottery. While their medium, context, and style associate stelae with the polis, their iconography is of the oikos. This paradox, as well as the prominence of women on gravestones, has led many scholars to focus on an analysis of the virtues designated to different genders on the stelae. An early example, from around 430 BC, is the so-called cat stella, on which the dead youth is accompanied by a mourning boy attendant and an animal, perhaps a cat, which is shown seated on top of a stella. Above the cat is a bird cage, to which the youth extends his right arm, while his left hand holds the bird. It's about three and a half feet tall, or one meter. It came from Agina and now resides in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens. One of the best preserved funerary reliefs of the 5th century BC, though, is the grave stella of Hegeso. Dating to around 420 to 440 BC, it provides a good example of this artistic format and is considered by many to be the finest Attic grave stella that has survived. It stands about 5 feet tall, or around 1.5 meters, and was erected in the Karamikos, which was the ancient cemetery of Athens near the Dipylon Gate. 
The original has been moved to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, while an exact replica has been left behind in its place. It would have been viewed within a parabolus tomb, facing the so-called Street of Tombs in the Karamaikos. There is an inscription that reads, Hegeso Proxeno, meaning Hegeso of Proxenius, or Hegeso, the daughter of Proxenius. The size and quality of the Stella of Hegeso indicates that her family was wealthier and more politically important than most. On it, Hegeso is shown as a typical noble Athenian lady, wearing a chiton and hymation, while seated on a chair with her feet resting on an elaborate footstool. To the left is a servant, wearing a tunic and a headdress. It's a scene of her choosing jewelry from a pyxis, or box, which is held by one of her servants. In her left hand, she is clasping the open box, and in her right hand, she would have held the selected piece of jewelry, but it is now missing. She is directing her gaze at this jewelry, and both Hegeso and her servant have very solemn expressions on their faces. It's a representation of a private moment that takes place within the household. And so, this poignant reflection of the dead makes clear that for all of their preoccupation with war and civic engagement, the Greeks could also feel private losses very deeply. While Hegeso's relief may show a purely domestic scene, the virtues it honors may not have been solely for private consumption. Rather than simply celebrating the individual lives of certain women, the presence of stellae, similar to that of Hegesos, also served to define women within a recognized social framework. From the time of Pericles onwards, Athenian men had a much greater vested interest in displaying their mother's status, partly due to the law by Pericles stating that any Athenian citizen needed to have a mother who was the daughter of another citizen. This law gave more importance to the childbearing role of women, since their children would later select their gravestones, as well as the importance of marriage and familial relationships, and so marrying non-Athenian women was now discouraged. While Pericles' citizenship law did not exactly change anything in terms of a woman's roles or freedoms, it codified their place in the hierarchy of the entire polis, which could be the underlying motive for Athenians during this time to represent such private family virtues on publicly viewed stellae. Anyways, we will discuss all of this and more on future episodes about women in classical Greece. On the next episode, having looked at the changes of sculpted works in the severe and classical styles in the 5th century BC, let us continue our deep dive into classical art and architecture by turning our attention to the painters. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 57, Classical Painting. Mm -hmm.